Hey everyone, Bruce Eckfeld here. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications so we can let you know when the next video is posted. You can also check us out at Eckfeld.com for more great content. With that, let's go check out the video. You're listening to Thinking Outside the Bud, where we speak with entrepreneurs, investors, thought leaders, researchers, advocates, and policymakers who are finding new and exciting ways for cannabis to positively impact business, society, and culture. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeldt. Welcome, everyone. This is Thinking Outside the Bud. I'm Bruce Heckfeld. I'm your host. And today we're here with Rick Martinez. And Rick is an entrepreneur. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit about his story uh, and how he got into uh, being an entrepreneur and then ultimately in the cannabis space. I'm excited for the conversation. Rick, welcome to the program. Hey, Bruce. It's a pleasure being here. Good seeing you again, too. Yeah, it is. Um, so, uh, why don't we start just a little bit with background? Because I always, uh, I always love to hear people's stories, and I really, I kind of love to hear how they got into the whole kind of cannabis space. Uh, everyone's got a different connection to it. Everyone's got a different starting point. So let's let's get a little sense of your background and and how it started, and then we can kind of talk about the current business and and what you're doing today. Sure. So I'll give you kind of like a bullet point timeline fashion, and sure. then if there if there's somewhere you want to dive in, then let me know. That's Perfect. that's cool. So in 1995, I graduated from nursing school with a four year degree, so a BSN, and so I'm I'm currently an RN. I'm not practicing, but in okay. 1995, I became a registered nurse. In 2001. Uh, was when we, I say my wife, she was my girlfriend then, but now my wife and I launched our first company. And simply put, as we did federal contracting, we put doctors and nurses into military bases. And as we all know, 9-11, uh, right around 2001, we obviously had no idea. Yeah. Uh, business was went, like, was a hockey stick growth, just with all the deployments. And if, if, then I was activated, actually. So next bullet point is, oh, wow. so became a nurse. We learned to scale compassion is that's really, I, I was on a podcast interview last week yeah. and they said, so you learned to scale compassion. I'm like, I guess we did. Yeah. So launched our, our staffing firm, federal contracting. I was activated as a reservist. So military officer, um, registered nurse, army nurse corps for 18 months. And during that period, the company we had started uh, was continuing to grow. We brought on a professional CEO management team. Uh, so activated, came home. And the company had was was on uh, was on its own legs, so we opened up some CrossFit gyms. So I think at that point, Bruce, I was I had fully engaged into this whole entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. And now, again, bullet point. Fast forward to about 2013, 14, we sold our company. So we had grown it to several hundred employees, 19 states, sold the business, um, including our, our gyms, all the assets. And it was kind of a reset for my wife and I, just like, what's next? Yeah. And so got into consulting, advising, mentoring, facilitation, um, especially as we both know through EO, the accelerator yeah. program, mm -hmm. and um, became a professional, the air quotes, <laughs> professional <laughs> basically professional facilitator and coach. And yeah. I loved it. And this leads to, you know, so how does cannabis fit into this is yeah. about two years ago, give or take, um, one of my clients who's actually a really, really good friend, uh, two tours as a Marine in Iraq, mm -hmm. um, kicking indoors, uh, said, Rick, I want to start a business. And so I'm like, sure for me. And I imagine for you on some level, the startup part is it's almost form formulaic. There's yeah. You do certain things and you just, you know, just do them and do them and do them. And, and the distinction was, he goes, and I want to help veterans with PTSD. And I'm like, cool, Grant, yeah, interesting, said, yeah. how, how are you going to do that? He goes, well, I want to, I wanted to launch my own CBD line. And Bruce, I had no idea what CBD was. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a, what you call a very traditional type of upbringing, very traditional person. So anything related to C, to CBD, I had no idea. Cannabis was no, no good. Yeah. And, um, that was my introduction to the whole CBD, uh, marijuana, cannabis world. And so um, I loved it so much, his idea and what he was doing, is that um, I stopped my coaching. I just stopped. And yeah. I became his co-founder. So that's where the whole journey started about two years ago in the cannabis. And it's been a ride so far. So bullet points, that's where we were, where we, uh, what we've done, and how we entered the cannabis space. So what was – I'm curious about this whole kind of introduction to cannabis. So what was your – up, up until meeting your co-founder and kind of learning about CBDs, 
I guess, what was your take on cannabis? Like, what was your position or your kind of mindset around cannabis at that point? It's a good question. I, I want to say that it was myopic. I was very, I had a narrow view. Mm -hmm. um, I was ignorant. I was narrow minded. Um, I was the pro, in my words, the prototypical parent yeah. who said to your children, anything that Cheech and Chong put in their mouths and smoked, or <laughs> if you saw it on yeah. Fast Times on Ridge or Pineapple Express, stay away. <laughs> You're so, dating us right now, but yes. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's how I, that's yeah. how I was, that's how I was raised. I mean, I never, it was never part of my upbringing or the circle of people I was in. And so as such, and then being a licensed, you know, being a yeah. registered nurse, yeah. I have other considerations. And so for me, my, I had a very traditional, again, in my words, mm -hmm. this is, this is no bueno, stay away. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so when you started to learn more about CBDs, what, what do you think was, was the epiphanies or, or what were the things that, that got you to rethink a little bit about cannabis as, you know, at, as, as a, a more sophisticated or, or a more multifaceted product? I think it was what what had happened was there was this um, this series of events that had been happening. So it was actually a convergence. So as an army nurse, we, as a nurse, period, my background is in ER trauma. So okay. and whether it's military or civilian, we can fix people up, patch them up pretty well. You know, if they lose a limb, we we can now have the technology to give them you know artificial limbs, and they can still run marathons. Um, if they lose an arm, there's prosthetics, whatever yeah. these things. The, one of the distinctions that I didn't really understand then, but where this converged was we can't fix what's up here in, in their minds. Yeah. And that's called traumatic brain injury, TBI, and PTSD. Mm -hmm. So seeing this over and over, this rampant, this rage, this, this uh, PTSD that we, it's just honestly, and I'm not going to get into any you know, yeah. personal or political statements, but it's there. We can mm -hmm. fix them physically, but mentally, emotionally, it's very difficult. So that's when I realized back when I was you know, activated in 06 and 07, that um, maybe there's something more that needs to be done, maybe as a healthcare practitioner. So I think where that's where I, I believe the seed was planted, where mm -hmm. I was going to be rethinking and reconsidering this whole cannabis thing. Back then, I didn't know that cannabis was even an option. Yeah. So enter my friend Grant and you know founding the company CitizenCBD.com was, I'm like, so this is a real alternative. And what really, really hit me right between the eyes, Bruce, was... My friend Grant, the, the founder, the CEO of, of Citizen, has significant PTSD. Yeah. And to the average person, they don't see a veteran with PTSD who has issues. What they see is a dude with problems. And so that was when I realized we we need to do something differently. And collectively, yes, but individually, what could I do? And then he said, Rick, I want to start this CBD company. And I'm like, wow. So there's some good to this plant. There's yeah. some, there's things. And then finding out that my friend Grant, so Grant, let me just back up. Yeah. He has a six figure job. He's a petroleum engineer now for mm -hmm. a very large multinational oil company. So he's a high functioning individual with a very difficult to manage with PTSD. Yeah. But CBD, I, I saw CBD help him. Yeah. I, I saw it. I saw it with my own as a clinician. I'm like, I could see the the changes in him and actually see them in his day to day activities. So it started to change gradually. And then that was pretty much the hammer, the nail in the coffin that yeah. said, I need to be a part of this. Yeah. Yeah. And so as as you kind of got involved in this new company, what did you I guess, what did you learn about CBD? And then what did you see as kind of the business opportunity around this? So what I learned what I learned is that there's a huge, huge education gap. Yeah. And I was part of that gap. I, I was like, we, you asked me a few minutes ago and I just, I didn't know what I didn't know. I, I didn't understand. And I see that more and more because I was that person. Anything, it was all just weed to me. It was all weed. Yeah. It was all cheech and It was all what I just shared with you. So the biggest gap that I saw was, was learned, was education. It was, it was simply education as the general public, the average American just doesn't understand the potential of this plant, whether it's CBD or medical marijuana or what have you, mm -hmm. massive potential. Now as an entrepreneur, Entrepreneur, man, it's uh, it's mind boggling. It's um, it's I mean, it's been compared to the, you know the modern day gold rush, compared to you know the tech boom of the '90s and all these things. And if you were to ask me, which you kind of did, I think it's the potential even bigger. Mm -hmm. I think it's even more massive than we currently understand. Yeah. So and so, how do you choose? <laughs> given given this kind of. Uh, a uh, myriad of options or myriad of possibility of the market, 
or how do you or how have you kind of figured out what part of this you want to play in, uh, either because of opportunity or leveraging your skills or like how do you how do you parse through that and make decisions? That's another great question. That's uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so I, I mentioned a while ago when we started. So we started our staffing firm, and when we did, it was basically me. Uh, I was my only employee, sole employee. We went from zero to 600 in several years. Wow. And on this interview, just literally a few weeks ago, what emerged was, so you learned to scale compassion. And I'm like, I, we did. We scaled compassion. And I remembered that. And I, I thought about that, as, especially as your question is, how do I choose? So how, how can I continue to scale what I'm really good at and yeah. have been trained? And that's compassion. And sure, we can scale the business, the citizen, the CBD company. It's mm -hmm. a product. But then I remembered um, a few years ago what I was doing prior to Citizen, prior to co-founding and helping launch, and that was advising, mentoring, and coaching. And I recall, so then it was, what, what happened, Bruce, it was a matter of, so do I, do I scale compassion in terms of a product-based company, you know, a CBD company, which is now national, mm -hmm. or do I go back to what really fuels me, and that's helping those companies grow and scale? You know, can I stay a part of Citizen and help it grow and scale, which I firmly believe, mm -hmm. or tap back into who I am as a nurse, as an entrepreneur, as somebody who wants to scale compassion and help several companies grow? And I chose the latter. So what I do now is I'm right back to where, like I shared, is right back to where I was prior, and that's mentoring, advising, and honestly, just coaching professionally, yeah. high-level coaching to um, nascent, early-stage cannabis entrepreneurs. And so yeah. for me, it was... Um, it wasn't rolling the dice or flipping a coin. It was, you know, I had to tap into what it, what it was that served me and yeah. what I guess they say is find your, um, your, how do you, what's that phrase about giving your gift to the world and you find your true passion, okay. your, yeah. your, your purpose, find your purpose and yeah. the purpose in life is to share your gift. So for me, it was working with multiple entrepreneurs in the cannabis space. And I think that makes sense. I mean, I, I like this idea because so a lot of people come to me and say, I want to get into cannabis, you know, and they, they think, well, I've got to open a dispensary or I'm going to set up a grow or something like that. And, and I actually think the idea of, well, let's figure out what are you really passionate about? What are you really good at? And how can we apply that to some aspect of the cannabis space? Because there's so many facets to the cannabis space that need innovation, that need entrepreneurs, that you know, may have, you know, very little to do with the actual plant product itself. I've seen companies that deal in training dispensary workers and setting up testing and standards laboratories and stuff that, that are quite removed from the actual plant product. But it's a way for people to apply their, their gifts, their, their passion and their gifts to cannabis in lots of different ways. Where, where have you seen sort of the more interesting applications or, or interesting opportunities for people T taking those gifts and and finding innovative ways of applying them to the cannabis space. Any good, any of the good stories out there? Yeah, you know what's interesting is so so as as we're talking today, yeah. my wife and I and literally in seventy two hours are flying to L A. We're flying to L A. to work with a brand new client, and uh, the brand new client is get this. They are a staffing firm, and the staffing firm, <laughs> while they have a very traditional business model, they have a very non traditional client base, and that is. Um, some of the some of the biggest cannabis operations in in the in the U.S. So it dawned on me it's like you know, so one of our so one of the things that my wife and I did really well we mastered the staffing industry yeah. public and public and federal private and federal and I thought a while ago uh, so I guess to answer your question is staffing it seems like really staffing and the reason is is because the industry is growing so fast there aren't enough people to yeah. fill the position just short and sweet so interesting and lo and behold this is one of our my wife and I this is one of our our, our clients and they're a staffing firm it's crazy but the second one is is um, is technology, and one yeah. would think how technology how, and I'll give you a real quick example. So there's an incubator here in my hometown called Realco, and they only work with high growth, high potential SaaS technology companies. And one of them had a very traditional service that they use. It helps an individual make a bigger selection, like on Mouth.com. So on okay. Mouth.com, you know you can select bourbons or peanuts, whatever, and their AI would basically help you go through a kit, um, a decision making tree, and it collects all the data. Yeah. And so I was talking to the founder one day, literally, and, and I was, you know, she saw a t-shirt I, I said, I had on, it said THC in it. And she goes, are you in the industry? I said, well, yeah, we are. And she said, I want to apply my technology to cannabis. And I said, oh my gosh, yeah. because, <laughs> well, here's the thing, Bruce, yeah. is that 
the first time I went into a dispensary, I had no idea about yeah. what was what. Yeah. And with her, with a simple technological piece that fits between dispensary with this huge, it's like a toy store of cannabis mm -hmm. and the brand new consumer or participant like myself, mm -hmm. uh, this technology helps us whittle through all the stuff. So to answer your question is two of the coolest things are staffing and technology. Technology hasn't even yet been fully tapped into this industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, that's that's kind of the big point of that I see around the cannabis industry right now, that it's it's actually the big opportunities are, are not the grows or not necessarily the dispensaries, which are certainly big opportunities. But the, the bigger one is all the products and services around this that need to get. I mean, some of it are is about applying things that we already know from other industries that just need to be brought into cannabis, whether it's you know supply chain management, whether it's branding, retail design, like all these kind of things that are going to matter. But even things that we haven't thought of yet. I mean, there's some interesting stuff around blockchain applications and stuff to, to help verify, you know, various products and chain of custody and things. But that, that there's so much potential in these is why it's such an exciting market, really, I think, for entrepreneurs, not not just the, the cannabis product itself, but really it's just it's a market that needs a lot of innovation and entrepreneurs are pretty good at that. So, yeah. so what else do you see in terms of having been in this market a little while? What are some of the, I guess... Uh, pitfalls, uh, lessons you've learned, uh, insights you've developed over time that, you know, if people are thinking about or kind of early stages of getting into the cannabis market that you would suggest they look into, steer them either away or towards just to maybe uh, lessen the school of hard knocks a little bit for some of these folks? Another good question. And you actually, I was actually part of your Inc. article yeah. about uh, maybe two months ago. Yeah. And I will say one of the, so I have, a, I'll, I'll mention three things, but one of them is merchant processing. It's just, yeah. it's, it's extremely difficult. And I say that because most people think, well, this PayPal or Stripe. And I'm like, okay, that, that will, that might work, but there's a lot of pitfalls and hazards to that. And if that is how one receives money from consumers, then it's it's still a, a difficult. There's no set answer. But so, and right let's now. let's kind of for for folks that don't quite understand this. So, what is the challenge around payments and the cannabis market? If you can just kind of summarize for folks. Yep. So I'm not an attorney, but yeah. basically, um, cannabis in our country it's still a Schedule One drug, which means it's it's not legal. Even though the states have some states have legalized it, it's not legal, which means a bank or general processors who like a PayPal. Uh, they fall under the auspices that this is a uh, not legal product and it's in a very gray area. So it's difficult to, um, to capture money, to get yeah. paid. It's difficult. So, yeah. um, that's a snapshot, but yeah. Uh, the second thing is the ease of entry. It's the barrier to, the barrier to entries, uh, is so incredibly low right now in, in, in the entire cannabis industry, uh, especially, um, e-commerce e-tailers. It's the easiest way to get one's foot in the door with the least with the least skin in the game, which in my opinion is a dangerous thing because there's all kinds of, you know, um, yeah. fraud, just poor business practices, um, shysters, uh, but not all, not all of them. Some are yeah. really good. So ease of entry is, it's a good and a very bad thing. And I think one of the biggest ones also is compliance. And, yeah. and so we experienced that at Citizen early because we, you know, we had our labels done, the things for our, you know, our, our tinctures and basically what, what went on the packaging mm -hmm. and, and paid for it and had it professionally and well done. And then later we brought on a, a company who was experienced in cannabis branding and marketing. They asked us a simple question about one word that was on our label. And they said, how's that working for you? And they said, anyway, the long and short is they would have advised us to have different wording, mm. uh, just to uh, put something down a different part of the label. And uh, boy, we wish we would have known these tiny, <laughs> tiny things in the early days. We had to go through a whole rebranding, relabeling. And um, so I think with the lesson there was to not go about it alone, to, yeah. to find a professional, to find somebody who understands the industry of cannabis, yeah. who understands the, the nuances and especially the compliance part. Yeah, we've had um, uh, on the show here. We've had a couple people on the on the branding and the strategy side, and they they certainly have echoed a lot of that. That there's there's so many simple little things that are easy to get wrong that can be very painful later. <laughs> you know, doing a little bit of work up front uh, can save some uh, save save some skin 
later in the game. What other advice kind of thoughts do you have for folks? I mean, I, you know, like I said, I, I get a lot of folks that are interested in the cannabis space in terms of either where to get started or things, things to kind of do before you really make a decision if you're going to go both feet into this or, or make significant investments. What would you, or I mean, I guess, what do you kind of talk to people about when you're speaking to these, you know, folks that are interested in getting it from a business standpoint? Yeah. So another good question. And so I think we can both, so both of us, we have um, been facilitators and trainers. So we understand the importance of strategy, execution, and tactics. And, and while that's important, you know, there's a lot of books and professionals like us who talk about that. I simply asked them one question. I said, and it's really beginning with the end in mind. Yeah. And, and I tell them to be very selfish about it. So what's in it for you? And there's even the tune your radio to WIFM. <laughs> I just, but I say, you know, so I understand you want to get into cannabis, whatever that means to you. What's in it for you? What's, yeah. what is your end state? Is it wealth creation? Is it, you know, you want to impact the world? You want to convert your, you know, your corn farm to, or soy to, to hemp, mm -hmm. you know, literally what's in it for you and what begin with the end in mind, because if we don't know where we're headed, then any path is okay. Then it's a matter of, yeah. oh, let's start an e-commerce site, or let me drop 10K or 50K or 100K into this dispensary. Or, and then we wonder why the hell yeah. life became so hard if we <laughs> don't know where the hell we're going. So I always ask them, begin with the end in mind. And, you know, yeah. what do you want out of this, of your investment or your foray or stepping into this world? Because yeah. it's a funny world. Yeah, it is, and it and it's. Uh, I find that it can it can take you on paths you don't necessarily want to go down if you're not careful. Okay. Yes. Any good resources? I mean, I, I know one of the things that's you know certainly been helpful for me is kind of connecting with folks and um, you know going to events, conferences, things like that to kind of learn more about things. What has what has been helpful for you in terms of learning more about the industry, learning more about the people in the industry, seeing where the opportunities are educating yourself um, where, what have you what have you done to uh, improve your ability to be an entrepreneur in the cannabis space so th this is going to sound a little facetious but it's mm -hmm. the truth the first place i the where i started was barnes and noble yeah. i kid you not <laughs> i went down to the bookstore and the magazine section now um, i go there monthly anyway uh -huh. there used to be one or two magazines about you know the whole marijuana world now yeah. there's nine or ten yeah it's it's painless um, if one doesn't have a car to get there, then order it online yeah. and have it shipped to your home for, for, for 30 bucks. You can buy 10 different magazines, give or take, yeah. and you can immerse yourself into every aspect of the industry. So that's the simple painless way. The second way is, again, this is something I did is I went to conferences. Yeah. Like I didn't know anything about the industry, but I'm like, damn, I need to learn. So call it total immersion. But I went and spent several days just walking the floors, talking to folks, getting to know people and seeing and yeah. understand. When you go to the conference, you get a little taste of the culture. It's a, it's a, it's a bit, bit of a different culture. Yeah. The last thing we did is we literally started a private Facebook group for cannabis entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, and it's totally free. We basically created our, instead of a place where we can convene that's online, there's, you know, there's no spam, no pitching, and mm -hmm. it's, um, it can be accessed on our website, which is wellnessprojectrx.com, and yeah. it's a free group. So cool. easy, easy way, just go to Barnes & Noble and read the magazines. To go read them. Yeah. The second, second thing, go to a conference. They're all over the place. Yeah, all the, they really all are. All the time. Third place is we have a free group. You yeah. can convene and ask questions about the business of cannabis. Yeah. I think, and I think that finding a community to interact with that, you know, are potentially at different stages of the path, but are along that stage of, of being an entrepreneur in the cannabis industry is, is huge because obviously we, we've been in the EO system for a long time and know the power of an entrepreneurial group. When you focus that then on cannabis, it's even just more powerful because you get that learning. Awesome. So, so where are you going with the business now and what's the next stages for you? What are you focused on and what are the big things that you've got coming up in the next year or two? So that's a great question. And <laughs> I, I actually went through, I went, so the training that I give to my clients, I went through a, a re-immersion. It's in Orange County. It's, it's MAP. It's Management Accountability Plan. And, yeah. and as a result, I had to emerge with what were my goals for the year. And yeah. so I literally just about an hour ago, I did, I did a, an Instagram and said, here's my goals. Awesome. And I, off my whiteboard, I pulled my goal sheet and my goal was to have five speaking engagements booked in the next uh, 12 months and today we just booked our second which is we're pretty excited and a uh, second goal for us honestly i, I it's about yeah. us and our business yeah. is we have we have a revenue target that we want to hit by virtue of our our cannabis um, mentoring slash coaching program so yeah. speak 
and coach. Yes, yeah. that's, that's our focus. We're driving hard towards those two um, um, big things, and and they're, they're smart goals. So we have you know yeah. metrics around them, but. Um, yeah. And it's just, and then just remaining open, just yeah. being open because one, there could be an opportunity that, um, yeah, as an entrepreneur, we could get pulled off track. So those are the two big ones that I'm open to seeing what else yep. emerges. Yeah. So staying it's, open. It's, it's important to stay open in this industry because you never know what's going to come at you. So, right. so let's pull out, let's pull out your crystal ball for a little bit, just in terms of the, the cannabis sector, the cannabis industry in general. What, um, what do you think is going to happen the next next year, two years. I mean, I know we've got all sorts of regulation stuff that's happening. We've got, you know, various states that are at various points. You know, what what do you see as kind of likely or maybe not likely just kind of understanding where the market's going from your point of view based on, on what you've seen or, or what you've been able to kind of develop insights around? Yeah. So right now, as as we're talking, uh, it was just, I think a few days ago, just this past week, um, Canada is now going to go recreational legal as a country. Yeah. And I think September, October, like in a few months. Yeah. So all eyes are on Canada. And for the entrepreneur who has a, you know, a vision or even just has a long term, like what's in it for me, they should be paying attention what's going to happen in Canada over the next few months as this goes rec legal. Yeah. And I, I think it's a little bit further out than two years, but where I believe is that there's going to be some emerging companies or players who are going to be setting themselves up for either an acquisition or to be, a, I just believe, I think there's going to be a segregation between the ones who are getting in it for the wrong reasons and yeah. the ones who are in it for the long term. And there's going to be distinctions and we're going to see the whole, oh, that's big business in cannabis now. It's like, yeah. And if you know it's coming, then be the big business. Yeah. Be the one. Don't get angry at the ones who are preparing or have been preparing. No. Jump on board now because it's going to happen fast. I mean, the entire country of Canada is now going to be recreational legal in the next few months. And there are, they're on our border. So all eyes are on, I think, are on the U.S. over the next few years. Yeah, no, I agree. Rick, this has been a pleasure. We're, we're just about at time here. Um, if people want to find out more about you, about your coaching, about some of the businesses you work with, what's the best way to get a hold of you and find out more information? The easiest way is to go to wellnessprojectrx.com. And we we have, it's just the simplest way. Uh, yeah, wellnessprojectrx.com. I will make sure that that link is in the show notes so people can access that. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm uh, excited to stay in touch and hear how things go. Like I said, it's uh, uh, it's always a pleasure to connect with folks in this in this space. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be doing interesting things in the coming months and years. So I'm looking forward to checking in and, and hopefully we can do another episode sometime. For sure. Thanks, Bruce. It was a pleasure talking again. Thanks, Rick. You've been listening to Thinking Outside the Bud with business coach Bruce Eckfeld. To find a full list of podcast episodes, Download the tools and worksheets and access other great content. Visit the website at thinkingoutsidethebud.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at thinkingoutsidethebud.com forward slash newsletter.